Hello everyone, my name is Arnaud Fontanet. I'm working at Institut Pasteur and Conservatoire National des Arts et Métiers. I have been asked to prepare, in a hurry, a presentation of the new coronavirus that you are all aware of, which has been named, when it comes to the disease, as COVID-19. As you can read on this slide, I decided to tell you all what we know until 20th, 20 February 2020, which is the date of today. As you understand, our knowledge is evolving very fast, and maybe there will be an update, I don't know yet, but uh, at this stage, I would like to share with you all what we have learned since the beginning of this epidemic. And to start with, on this first slide, you can see a picture, the first picture available of this coronavirus. Why do we call it coronavirus? Because as you can see on these slides, around the virus itself, there is a little crown. The crown is made of the spike protein, which the virus is using to enter the cells. And this is what gives this very special shape um, that made the virus be named coronavirus. The first time we heard of this new coronavirus, I'm talking here about the community of epidemiologists or specialists of infectious disease, was on 30th December 2019. PROMED is an internet list um, of news about whatever is happening in infectious disease, outbreak, clusters, epidemics in the world, we are, many of us are registered to this list and we receive every day emails. And on that specific day, we had an email which really caught our attention. Here I have put the main um, sentences of that mail where we are told that there was an urgent notice for treatment of pneumonia of a known cause that it was related to a market in the city of Wuhan, the South China Seafood Market, and there were already four cases of pneumonia. This doesn't sound so terrifying, four cases of pneumonia, but we are all aware that 17 years before, in the southeast of China, near Guangdong, there had been a very similar story where cases of pneumonia of unknown origin had been linked to a market that was the beginning of SARS. And I'm pretty sure that most of us, when we read that notification, we were all thinking that this could be a new SARS coming to China. We did not get much more news in the coming next days. We heard that the China had officially declared to WHO that they had a concern about those pneumonia of a known origin. But information were still very scarce. And on 10 January 2020, first big news, um, Eddie Holmes, a virologist from Australia, very well known, posted on behalf of Chinese colleague on the site which is called virological.org, the full sequence of a new genome of a virus. And that was this coronavirus that we were all suspecting that might have been replacing SARS. So if you follow the link that has been put on this slide, and then you click on the other link to the, what, where it's called update, you will get the exact full sequence of uh, close to 30,000 nucleotides of this new virus. That was really a big step because we understand that something happened in China from mid-December in Wuhan that physicians were smart enough to relate those patients to the same market, suspect something very special was happening because it was not flu, although the clinical picture was looking like flu. And less than one month later, we already have a new virus fully sequenced by next generation sequencing, which is a daunting task, and that has been very remarkable. Even more than that, this has allowed all the reference laboratories of the world to prepare primers for PCR reaction so that in all countries would cases be exported from this initial cluster of Wuhan, the diagnosis could be possible. And Hong Kong University, as well as colleagues from the Charité in Germany with Christian Drosten, were able to very quickly post on the WHO website 
the primers that people could use to make this new diagnosis. And again, that has been really important because this has allowed all laboratories of the world, reference laboratories for viral respiratory disease, to get ready for diagnosis in their own countries would new cases arise. However, at that stage, we were not that concerned because on 12 January 2020, a rather reassuring message is posted again on ProMed, telling us a little bit the follow-up of what we had learned a few days before when we were informed about these four cases of pneumonia. Now there are 41. There has been one death. However, as you can read here, most of them are related to that same Chinese market, the seafood Chinese market. And as also stated here, there has been no cases among healthcare workers, no evidence of human-to-human -human transmission. If there is no human-to-human -human transmission, then the risk of epidemic is extremely low, actually nil. Of course, we were wondering, I mean, did this information complete may have they missed eventually some chains of transmission, but that was quite reassuring. And the story was therefore, there probably has been from the market emergence of a new virus from one animal, we don't know which one. That virus has come into human population, infected 41 people, no human to human transmission. Those 41 people will follow their fate, some may eventually die, most will survive, but that will be the end of the story. And we were feeling much better. Also, as you can read on this posting, the market had been closed. So most likely the animal source has been put on the side and uh, would not uh, reinfect other people and therefore would not start a new epidemic. So that was making us feeling much better and we are on 12 January 2020. However, a few days later, actually the day after, 13 January 2020, we hear from our colleagues from Thailand that at one airport, a woman coming from China is diagnosed with this new coronavirus. And three days later, it's a case which is diagnosed in Japan. And then we are all a bit puzzled. How come do you have only 41 cases in the city of Wuhan and already two cases exported to Thailand and Japan? Something doesn't work. The math behind have been dealt with by the Imperial College in London and using data of air travel outside of Wuhan, um, catchment area among the people of Wuhan that would go eventually to airport and, and travel, etc. They ended up with an estimate of 1,723 cases of new coronavirus in Wuhan in order to have already one case export to Thailand and another one exported to Japan. So we are no longer with a story of 41 cases in Wuhan, it may be between 1,500 and 2,000, and most likely there has been human-to-human -human transmission, and most likely we are moving towards an um, epidemic in China, definitely, possibly a worldwide pandemic, and it's a completely different picture that emerged from that day. What I am showing you here is a website which has been taken care of by Johns Hopkins in order to count cases all over the world, in a way to monitor the way the epidemic is progressing. This is probably two days ago, so 18th of February, at the time the slide was taken. You have more than 70,000 cases worldwide. And you can also count on the right side that we are close to 2,000 deaths. Most of cases are in China, as you can read. And uh, these are actually 70,000. This is the left column that you can see on this slide. And then you have a series of countries which tell you how many cases they have. Also, you can read Diamond Princess on the top, which is more than 400. Diamond Princess, as you may know, is this ship which is uh, in Japan currently, where there has been a massive epidemic among the 3,500 people who were staying on that ship. And uh, the other countries, Singapore comes on the top with uh, 77 cases on that date. Japan, Hong Kong, Thailand, whatever. What started to be a little bit worrisome, I think there are 28 countries altogether that have had cases, and about 10 of them where you have had already local transmission happening. What is a bit worrisome with Singapore and South Korea is that they really recently mentioned that 
for some of the new cases, they were no longer able to trace it back to either someone coming from China or someone who had been in contact with an infected person. That tells you that the epidemic is now gradually generalizing, moving um, and expanding in those countries. Still control, uh, we are less than 100 cases and it's not moving very fast. But if you can no longer reconstruct the chain of transmission, that means that the problem may become bigger in the coming days. So we are now with a picture of a very large number of cases in China. Um, 70,000 counted, the estimates are probably more than twice more, even more than that, if you look at the modeling work which has been performed. As you know by now, I mean, the Chinese authorities have taken very radical measures to try to contain that epidemic, and we will come back to that. And elsewhere in the world, we have seen imported cases, local transmission, something which is reasonably contained, but also uh, some signs of um, potential uh, breach of control to the point that the epidemic could no longer be controlled. And also some unknown, I mean, what is happening in India? India, a country with 1.3 billion people. What is happening in Africa? There has been so far only one case in Egypt. We will come back to that. So, well, how are we going to deal with this epidemic now? Let's come to the clinical description of cases. There have been publications recently in the major journals like Lancet and New England Journal of Medicine. The main symptom is fever. Uh, at admission, it was 83% of this slide, but altogether, if you count before at admission or just after, you will reach about 100% of people that have fever among those who have clinical manifestations. Cough comes next uh, in about 70% of patients, a little bit higher on this uh, series of 99 patients shown here. Shortness of breath will be happening in some patients that have a real severe pneumonia. The rest of the symptoms, as you can see, are relatively minor. If you have sore throat, unlikely to be the new coronavirus. If you have rhinorrhea, unlikely to be this new coronavirus. And diarrhea has been described in 5 to 10% of patients. That also happened with SARS, about at the same level. So, basically, um, people present with fever, dry cough, and for some of them, shortness of breath. And you have on the right side a X-ray of a patient that has full pneumonia associated with this new coronavirus. One of the first questions that people ask is how lethal is this new coronavirus? And as for any epidemic which is starting, it's really difficult to get a proper estimate because what do you see at the beginning? You see at the beginning the people that will go to hospital and there are those who have the severe form of disease. So the first case fatality rate that you are going to estimate will be among people that have the most severe forms of disease and it's usually quite worrisome. And indeed, from the cases de detected in mainland China, as shown on the left side of this slide, you see that the case fatality rate has been estimated between 15 and 20 percent. So those who have severe pneumonia that were hospitalized because of the severe pneumonia ended up with a risk of dying between 15 and 20 percent. A little bit more than SARS, a little bit less than MERS, which is the other coronavirus that is currently uh, spreading in the uh, Gulf countries. If you look at the cases that were detected outside of China, where you have a broader spectrum of disease with people that may have more minor form of disease, then the overall estimate of case fatality rate goes down to 2%. Um, and that is a bit more reasonable, you know. So there you have the people that have severe pneumonia, but you also have people that just had fever, a bit of cough, not much more. What we do not know is what is at the bottom of this pyramid, which are the asymptomatic cases or those with very few symptoms. And there may be some, there may even be many, we just don't know yet. We will learn about them when we will have serological tests that allows us to test for antibodies in the blood of individuals. And we will know from people that have antibodies whether they had symptoms or not and get a better picture of the full spectrum of disease. That should happen in the coming, I would say, four to eight weeks because those serological tests will soon become available. Once we know all the spectrum of disease, we will be able to have an idea about how many people have been truly infected and out of these, how many have died and a much better understanding of the case fatality ratio, and this is soon to come. 
Now, just to show you a little bit what has been happening with the epidemiological investigations. Of course, this slide is very busy and you are not going to be able to read it if you are using your smartphone, for instance, and the point is not there. What I'm just trying to convey here is that this epidemiological investigation is like a detective work where we are going to track every individual that has been infected, who that person has been in contact with, where, how many cases you have, how many contacts, all those people will have to be followed for 14 days to make sure that they have not been infected themselves. Why 14 days? Because this is a maximum incubation period as we understand it now, and I will come back to that. But you realize now that this is really a very um, tricky job, that not only you have to identify those patients very early to put them in isolation, but you will have to follow all the contacts and make sure that they, can, they do not develop the disease during a period of 14 days. Here is a story of um, someone that was in Singapore attending a business meeting there. That person um, from the UK went back to the UK through France, stayed four days in a skiing resort in the Alps, and then moved back to the UK. When that person reached the UK, he read a mail coming from his company telling him that someone that who was attending the meeting in Singapore, a Chinese person, had gone back to China and had developed a new coronavirus disease. Therefore, we were asking him to check whether he was feeling well. And actually, he was not feeling so well. So he went to um, the hospital, to a GP first, then hospital, was diagnosed with a new coronavirus. And the Public Health England, I mean the health safety agency of the UK, Ask him, where have you been during these past 14 days? And he said, well, been traveling there, here and there. I was in France. Well, immediately, Public Health England calls Santé Publique France and tells them, you have to check in that Alps resort called Contamine Montjoie, because this person has been staying uh, in a, um, I don't know how to call that in English, a chalet, we say in French. It's a place where you can stay for vacation where you are skiing. Anyway, he was there and we, it turned out that in that place he infected 10 people. Five who stayed in France, four who went to the UK, one who moved to Spain. So immediately the French authorities have put these people in isolation if they were sick uh, and also for those that have been close contacts to make sure that they would not develop the disease and actually one of them ultimately developed the disease. So you see, it's a very complex investigation and here we can say somewhat we have been very lucky because the company heard of the case in China and alerted everyone but also there has been an incredible international collaboration that allowed to identify all the contacts and put them in the isolation and currently the situation seems to be controlled. Will that continue in the future? We will be as lucky as this time. This is a big unknown and matter of being worried for what, whatever could happen because now, as in this example, not all cases come from China, but they can come from Singapore and that makes the tracing of the potential suspect cases much more difficult. So, from those very detailed stu studies that I have shown to you and some from the data that have been obtained from China, a number of important indicators have been obtained. One is the incubation period. The estimates for uh, this new coronavirus is around, as you can read, about six days, with a maximum around 12 to 14 days. So this quarantine of 14 days has been properly chosen because indeed this is covering the entire possible spectrum of incubation periods. It's pretty similar to SARS and pretty similar to MERS, as you can see here. More important is when are people contagious? With SARS, what was really important is that you were contagious only three, four days after developing symptoms. Why was it important? Because it gives you three, four days to identify the patient, make the diagnosis, and put that patient in isolation before that person has infected somebody else. So it was actually reasonably easy to contain SARS, as people were contagious only three or four days after beginning of symptoms. And because with SARS, you only had severe forms of disease. You did not have minor form of disease, so people were going to hospital. Now, with this new virus, unfortunately, it is not the same picture. First of all, from all what we have learned now, we understand that people are contagious 
from the beginning of symptoms and for some of them, as illustrated on this slide, which was a cluster in Germany, some people can be contagious while they are not yet symptomatic. And that makes it much more difficult to have isolation procedures working because, as you understand, at the time you identify the people and you put them in isolation, they might have already contaminated other people. So here we are facing a rather tricky situation. Will those asymptomatic transmission count a lot in the dynamic of the epidemic? We believe at this stage not. We still believe that most of people will be contagious only when they are symptomatic and particularly when they are coughing and expect, expelling droplets and therefore at the time they are really fully symptomatic. But we do know now that some people can be contagious before symptoms and again that is going to be to make control much more difficult. If you want to play a little bit with some modeling tool, I give you here a site which has been prepared by Toronto University, so you have the link here. And if you go there, you can adjust different parameters and see the dynamic of the epidemic. Here is without any control measures. Here is with control measures. And here is the observed number of cases. And what you can play with is this famous uh, basic reproductive number, you know, which is number of cases that each patient will generate. So each person who is sick will infect here 2.6 other people in the absence of control measures. But once you start to introduce control measures, then you can decide and on this uh, software, here I have chosen, for instance, that the basic reproductive number would go down from 2.6 to 1.7. You can decide on the outbreak start and control start date and that I have used what has we have known from the literature. And the last parameter you can use is what we call the serial interval, which is really important. What is this? Is when somebody is sick and will infect people, this is the number of days before those people be become sick themselves. So here we have seven days. What does it mean? Is someone is sick and the person that that patient will infect will become sick themselves seven days later. The shorter this serial interval, the quicker the epidemic would move up and the longer, the lower the epidemic will go. So you can play with that and um, understand better how basic reproductive number, serial interval can really have an importance on an epidemic. And this is why the modelers, the first thing they are trying to do when they are looking at a new virus is how can we estimate this basic reproductive number and serial in interval because they will be so critical on the dynamic of the epidemic. Going to the transmission, what do we know now? By analogy with SARS and MERS, this other coronavirus, we believe that droplets will be very important into the transmission. Droplets is when you cough, what goes up to 1 meter, 1.5 meters out of your mouth, and that's really where you are contagious. But as you can see on this picture taken from the MIT lab in the States, uh, when you cough, I mean, things can be very different depending on the intensity of coughing. So this 1.5 meter, of course, is something that you have to take with some distance because depending on the nature of the coughing or whatever, it could be more, could be less. We still believe that droplets are the major modes of transmission and what we call aerosols, which would be much finer particles that may eventually contain the virus and that can go much further for the current state of knowledge would not count that much in transmission. So we are still thinking that these are the close contacts, people that have been staying one meter, 1.5 meter from you, that would be most at risk. We are talking about your family members. We are talking, for instance, if you are going to hospital, to the people that will take care of you in the hospital. And as we know now, there have been, unfortunately, many healthcare workers infected in China. Um, something that had not been completely acknowledged at the beginning, but that is fully recognized now. So epidemic control, what are we going to do? Well, for the epidemic control, there are all the stories about if you cough, you just use your elbow and cough in your elbow. If you use tissues, just one, and you drop them, don't reuse them because then they become really vectors for carrying the virus. Clean your hands. Hand hygiene is absolutely key when you have a respiratory disease because what you are going to do is you cough in your hands, you touch your mouth, you put it on the table, you will you took a handle, you will press on the button in the lift 
and there you can leave some virus and therefore it is really important that you have a very strict hand hygiene at the time of epidemics. If, if you become sick and if there is a risk because you are living in an epidemic area that you have got this new coronavirus, you put a mask, a surgical mask is enough to protect your surrounding and you call the emergency numbers that have been given to you so that you can discuss whether you should be sent for a hospital for diagnostic and isolation eventually. In hospitals, indeed, I mean, the patients have to be put there for care. They also have to be put there for isolation. And for the staff, as you can see on this slide, I mean, they have to wear protective equipment. It may not be as, let's say, here you really feel they are dressed like cosmonauts, but in fact, they need to have um, Google, they need to have a mask, a special filtering mask, like the one of this slide, which is stronger than the surgical mask. And they have to have um, a cover um, that you have here, um, just to be protected with, of course, uh, gloves on their hands. Um, that would be exactly the same measures that would be taken for patients who have flu, for instance. And as you have seen in China, the need for beds has been so huge that they have done incredible things like building a hospital in less than two weeks. Um, and this is the time difference between those two pictures. So epidemic control is barrier measures um, that have been described on the left, strict hand hygiene, and then to a certain level, what has been done in China, um, which we put under a term which is called social distanciation. That goes starting with, let's say, let's close bars, restaurants, let's eventually um, forbid the gathering of people, mass gathering, uh, like big uh, sporting events or things like that, uh, closing movie, uh, movie theater. At a certain stage, it can be uh, public transportation. And then uh, if it goes further, as has happened for the city of Wuhan and all the neighboring cities, these are truly cities that have been put completely isolated from the rest of the country because there was so much concern of exporting the, uh, the disease. So now in China, up to 60 million people have been put under isolation through these very strict measures. Um, it's exceptional. It has been done because of the situation in China. In other countries, we are still to what is shown on the left side, which are much more a personal measure that you take and eventually at the airport some control of the temperature to see if some people would come with fever. As you understand now, this virus, it did not kill that many people. If you compare it with seasonal flu, for instance, do you know how many people die of seasonal flu every year? 300 to 600,000 in the world. And that crisis of coronavirus so far has eventually killed 2,000, 3,000 people. We may reach eventually 10, 20,000 people. For China, we will never be any close to what seasonal flu is killing. And still, have you seen the crisis in China? 50 million people put under quarantine and the airport transportation that is stopped. Um, you have seen now a major economic impact. And when China is coughing, I mean, it's the entire world which is coughing uh, with all the impact they have now in the worldwide economy. So realize that a virus that at the end of the day may not kill that many people if you compare to other infectious diseases and particularly flu, may have major political and economical impact. And in China, you have all heard of the story of this physician who you can see on the le down left of this slide, this physician who was among the first ones to realize something wrong was happening in Wuhan, who talked to the authorities, who was asked to remain silent, and who, by taking care of patients, ultimately died. He is now a hero in China for his courage. And again, I mean, look at all the impact a crisis like this one can have beyond being a simple disease. Now, for the future, our concerns are if the virus is exported to countries that have more vulnerable health systems, what is going to happen? I already mentioned India. Um, Philippines also has some cases. And in Africa, there was published today a paper in The Lancet giving you an estimate of the risk for countries uh, where it is more likely that the virus would be exported. Come top of the list, Egypt, Algeria and South Africa. And we already know that there has been one case in Egypt diagnosed last week. So here there is some preparation being done. The Institut Pasteur, and you know I work at Institut Pasteur, has, there is this international network of institutes around the world with, which are 
in Africa, 11 institutes belonging to the network of Institute Pasteur. All these institutes are getting ready. Training has been organized in Senegal by the team in Dakar that is very well known for its uh, knowledge about diagnosis of emerging viruses. And they have trained already a group of uh, technicians from 50 countries and they are doing the same in a few days. So the kits have been exported from Hong Kong, the one that I mentioned earlier, and from the Charité Berlin in, in, um, in Germany. And Africa is getting ready, but there will be a need for strengthening of the surveillance system in order to prevent the virus to come to China. As you know, there are a lot of links now with, between China, sorry, to come to Africa. As you know, there are a lot of links now between China and Africa. Now to conclude, I would say a few words about the origin of the virus. Here is the first phylogenetic tree that has been made available. As you can see, the strains are here, the Wuhan of uh, strains of this new coronavirus. As you can see on the phylogenetic tree, they are all absolutely identical. And it points at a single source introduction of virus in the population. If you use a molecular clock, you can date it to the end of November, which fits very well with the epidemiological observation. Now that virus has mutated and changed a little bit, I'll come back to that, but basically at the beginning, all the strains were absolutely identical. The closest relative of this new virus, you find it in bats, and there is one bat that has a 96% identity when it comes to the virus with this new coronavirus. However, we do not believe that it comes from bat because at the place which we call the receptor binding domain of the virus, the identity between the bat virus and the human virus becomes much less close than this 96% that you find on the overall genome. And this is important because this binding domain is the one that will uh, go to the receptor on the human cells of the respiratory tract. For SARS coronavirus, the receptor is well known, it's ACE2, and here is the spike protein of the virus. For this new coronavirus, here is a spike protein, and I can tell you now, we know that it is ACE2, which is also the receptor on the human cells, whereas for the MERS, it's a different receptor, which is called CT26. So, what animal would have a virus that fits to the receptor in a way that it would be then ready to jump to humans? The closest homology so far has been found among pangolins. So, pangolins are here on this slide. And this animal that is, um, I cannot say, sold in Chinese markets, but you know that it's illegal. I mean, they are not allowed to trade uh, pangolins. They use it for the meat and from tra traditional medicine. If you look at the six critical sites for binding to the receptor, then between the humans and pangolin, it's exactly identical residues that you find. And for this reason, we start to believe that the pangolin could be either the animal that started the epidemic or an animal that infected another one that uh, ultimately uh, started the epidemic. Um, if you want to follow now on the viral mutations, go to the next train org. You have here um, in Seattle a group with Trevor Bedford that has centralized all the full genome sequence available worldwide. And you start with the Wuhan strains, which are all identical. And here you have the number of mutations, one, two, three, up to seven. And you can see the, those strains diverging. And if you click on it, it will show you where it comes from, where, and then you can build the chain of transmission. It is done for you here. And you can look also on the genome. Here is a spike protein. Those mutations that we are concerned about because they would help the virus to be better adapted to its human receptor. So you can play with that um, uh, website. It's really very informative and you have a live analysis by some of the best phylogenetists. Now going back to pangolin, well, the moral of the story, let those animals, like all other wild animals, live where they are. Because unfortunately for those animals, I mean, of course, it's a tragedy to be caught and, and, and used for as meat or for whatever other things, but also they can be a source of infection that like SARS and now this new coronavirus can be very damaging for the world. So the and mes take home message also of this uh, lecture will be, well, just leave the wild animals where they are and we will all be better off. Thank you very much for your attention.